I'm Rachel Schrock, Associate Director in the Chicago office. We're grateful to have been able to produce this virtual screening of Anote's ARC and question and answer session in partnership with our longtime friends at the Gene Siskel Film Center, SEMA Studios, and the Environmental Law and Policy Center here in Chicago. Before we get started, we want to thank our partners in the HRW Chicago Committee for their incredible support on this exciting endeavor. This has been our largest screening to date. It's so exciting. I especially want to thank Chicago film team members Mitch Kobe, John Lee, Claire Gallagher, Dorothy Press, and Schnee Zabarek for their support. I'd also like to thank our tireless and fearless co-chairs, Terry Abruzzo and Chalini Sharma. The Chicago Committee film team selects films that highlight human rights issues, and especially issues we haven't frequently discussed within the HRW Chicago community. So we're glad to take a closer look at human rights implications of climate change. As a bit of background, Anote's ARC filmmaker and director, oh, as a bit of background, we were hoping to launch an in-person Chicago Film Festival this May at the Siskel Center. Thanks to SEMA's platform, we were able to bring you this film, so there's a silver lining there. A special shout out to Daniela Cohn for her amazing help. I'm thrilled to welcome Anote's ARC filmmaker and director, Matthew <laughs> Reitz, and Human Rights Watch senior researcher on environment and human rights, Felix Horn. The film will still be available for free to watch for the next few hours, so please do share the registration link with any friends or family who have not seen it yet. We'll post the link in the chat box. After tonight, the film is also available to rent on iTunes. Human Rights Watch needs your help to protect environmental rights defenders around the world, and a gift today will be matched five times. You can find a link to donate in the chat box to the right. Thank you so much again for joining us to participate in watching the film and being with us today. And now I want to hand this over to my colleague and friend, Jen Nedbalski, Deputy Director of the Human Rights Watch Film Festival. Thanks, Jen. Oh, thank you so much, Rachel. All right, I'm so excited to have everybody here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I'm Jen Nedbalski, the Deputy Director of the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, and we are very excited. Uh, the festival is in its 31st year, and we offer events in over 20 cities around the world. So here we are digitally um, from my house to your house. Uh, we want to give you a quick tour of CrowdCast so you can get a sense of how this will work. Um, first, captioning is being provided for tonight's discussion. If you follow the button at the bottom of the screen, you can open up the, uh, a different page that will have uh, the captions that you can watch side by side. The video is also streaming live on YouTube as well as on Facebook. Um, and we will be hosting a caption version of the recorded video after tonight's discussion on our Vimeo page. Um, and we do have uh, the Crowdcast chat box that you will see to the right. Thank you so much for all of you saying hi. I'm here from Brooklyn, Rachel's in Chicago. Uh, we have our two speakers I will introduce you to in a moment. Uh, we hope that you will ask questions in the box uh, the, the, at the bottom of your screen that says, ask a question. Um, and please uh, say hi in the chat box. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know what you thought about the film. Um, so to kick things off, I will ask a few questions to the panelists and then we'll pull questions from, from you in the, chat, in the chat area and in the ask a question box. So without further ado, I'm going to invite to the screen we have uh, the filmmaker, Matthew Reitz, uh, tuning in from Bali. And we have, uh, if I can do this, uh, we have our, my colleague, Felix Horn. So um, welcome everybody, happy to have you. Um, so we have Matthew tuning in from Bali, the filmmaker behind Anote's Park. He is a producer, curator, uh, and, photographer, and his work has led him across the globe to photograph cultural and human diversity. Joining us from Ottawa, Canada, we have Felix Horn, our senior researcher with the Environment and Human Rights Division for Human Rights Watch. Prior to working for Human Rights Watch, Felix worked on a number of indigenous rights and environmental issues in northern Canada and internationally, including several years of research in the impact of agricultural investment in Africa. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, so to get things started, I wanted to, uh, to kick things off with a question to you, Matthew. Um, 
Thank you for telling this story about Kiribati and hiding, highlighting this issue. It's a beautiful film. How did you come to tell this story and to meet Anote Tong and Sermery? Hello, good evening to everyone. First, you know, I just want to say I'm really happy to be to be here in this uh, event and you know to be able to share uh, again the story with the audience and for the one who didn't see the film yet, please do it. Um, so it's it's a, it's it's a really interesting journey I, I've been through because I started as you know photo, photographing the issue of uh, as a global issue of the rising sea, and I started um, working on this issue actually in Panama. Um, in a place called Sandras or Kunayala, which is a, a 300 and something, 350 something island, all the way down to the coast of, um, of, of uh, all the way to, to Colombia, all the coast of Panama. And I was very intrigued by, you know, this, this concept of, of um, climate justice and, and, and climate change to start with, you know, just how, how the climate change will impact the most vulnerable. So I really started digging into this story. And then I was like, but I'm sure there's some other place in the planet where, you know, people are going through the same difficulties and the same interests. So, and I start digging into into the you know the Pacific, and I remember one point I basically opened a, 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 a atlas like a world map, and I check in the middle of the Pacific there was this country called Kiribati, Republic of Kiribati. I say, whoa, what a minute! I never heard about that country, you know, and I've been looking at maps for so long, and I was like. I was so intrigued to start with, like, what's, where, who are they, like, what's it doing in, like, you know, in this middle of, of, the, of the Pacific and just without even noticing that the country existed before. So I basically decided to, uh, to fly to, to Kiribati as a photographer and, and, and covering. So I get an assignment with the New York Times for 15 days, just go there and starting, you know, making some image uh, around, around, around the, around those issues. And, the, the day before, actually, I get back home, uh, I met with President Tom um, almost randomly. And I was so amazed by, by his character and his mission. And I was like, what's his story? You know, the head of states, knowing he will be stateless within the century, and he, he has to fight against all odds to save his entire nation. So at that specific moment, I decided to, I mean, I asked President Tong, and, I did, and he said yes, and we decided to, to start this feature film journey. So it was a, in a way interesting because it was not really planned, but it was a very interesting journey. Wow. And how, um, you know, after watching the film, you become so attached to Sermery and her family and to Anote. Can you tell me um, what, do you have an update on the characters and what's new in their lives? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so Sir Mary, I was I was with her actually um, about a month ago in Auckland, New Zealand, and she's okay. I mean, it's it's difficult, you know, life economically. Uh, you know, you you come from a place where you never you know, have to deal with money. Uh, very strong communities, and you basically have you know food security. You can just go on the lagoon and have your fresh fish and everything, all the way to a totally different culture where everything is have to be. But you know, like basically in Auckland, she she need to work, and but in a way, it's it's not bad. It's not a bad migration story, thanks to New Zealand also. You know, I think New Zealand has did a really great job of trying to integrate all the islands, not only Kiribati, all the islanders into the society. And yeah, there's a housing crisis in Auckland. It's very difficult, but overall, the community is strong, and I felt like she was okay. Uh, she missed home, but it's not like she was okay. Uh, and just rebuilding a new new life, you know, and new friends and families and just like everything has to, to be rebuilt in a new, totally new and different country. As for President Tong, the last news I had from him, he was stuck in Fiji because he couldn't go back home because Kiribati is one of those uh, countries that totally shut down because of COVID-19. Uh, as many actually Pacific nations, they just shut down the airport. So there's no movement, nothing. So I was like really keen to just go back home. <laughs> He's still traveling a lot to, um, you know, in his campaign to, to advocate for, for climate change. But uh, yeah, so that was the last news, waiting, waiting to go home. Um, so my, I wanted to ask Felix a, a question. Um, how does this, the, the film um, tie into your work on environmental human rights and what we do here at Human Rights Watch. Yeah, no, it fits in there nicely. Um, I mean, on climate change, Human Rights Watch is focused both on mitigation and adaptation. So mitigation, you're basically encouraging governments to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. 
and on adaptation, ensuring that governments live up to the responsibilities to help communities adapt to the impacts of climate change. Uh, I think there's this sense that climate change is this thing that's in the future. Uh, and I think this film underscores really nicely that climate change is, is here and now for, for many communities. Um, you know, one of the projects that we're currently working on in that adaptation uh, uh, realm is a report on Canada uh, and Indigenous peoples. So Indigenous peoples in Canada have contributed very little to, to greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change, but are disproportionately impacted by climate change. So they're very much reliant on, on the land to provide uh, food in terms of hunting, in terms of fishing. Um, and they're reporting that there's been a lot of changes to rainfall patterns, a lot of uh, extreme heat, uh, changes in, in migration patterns of certain animals that they had harvested. So this is making it much more difficult for them to, uh, to achieve their, uh, their food security. And unfortunately, uh, there are not many other options in some of these very remote communities. You know, so there, there is some stores, but the food is extremely expensive and, and quite poor quality. Um, and I think one of the messages on that Canada report, again, is that climate change is not something that's in the future. It's not abstract. It's real. It's here. Uh, and it's going to get much, much worse without governments taking uh, immediate action. Mm. And can you tell me a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing to protect environmental activists and why that strategy is a, pr a priority for Human Rights Watch? Yeah, I mean, human rights defenders in general have been under attack for a number of years, you know, in, in part because uh, with social media, it's much uh, easier for an activist who perhaps doesn't have a lot of uh, financial resources or, or um, you know, access to the halls of power to actually have a huge influence uh, over governmental policy. So governments have responded uh, with various attacks against human rights defenders uh, in, in recent years. Environmental human rights defenders are even more vulnerable, uh, largely because they're in remote areas. Uh, they're quite far from those, those, those mechanisms and instruments that can protect human rights defenders. You know, they don't have access to the media. They don't have access to other NGOs that can offer protection or... or uh, you know, in some cases for um, uh, national government agencies or, or embassies that can provide some form of protection. Um, so, so basically our strategy is to, to uh, draw attention to a lot of these, of these incidents, you know, whether it's environmental activists that have been arrested or being harassed or have been disappeared. Uh, we draw attention to laws that make it more difficult for civil society to organize and to operate freely uh, or, or laws that restrict protests. Uh, uh, things like this, you know, make, ensure that there's a political cost for governments to engaging in these activities. <clears throat> Unfortunately, a lot of environmental human rights defenders that, again, are located in quite remote areas, it's quite difficult for them to get national media attention uh, for, for their plight. So, so we, we certainly try to help that and increase the exposure and increase that political cost. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, for those of you who are tuning in uh, by Facebook Live and by YouTube, I uh, wanted to mention that we are talking about the film Anote's Ark, which is available, if you're in the United States, available for free uh, with a link from Human Rights Watch. Uh, we'll post in the chat area, both on Facebook Live and on uh, Crowdcast and YouTube, where you can register and watch the film for free for in the United States. Uh, if you're outside of the United States, you can watch the film on iTunes. Uh, obviously, we highly recommend it. So thanks again. We have the filmmaker here, Matthew Reitz. We have Felix Horn, the senior researcher for environmental human rights at Human Rights Watch. Um, I wonder as well, um, Felix, before we jump to audience questions, if you can tell us a little bit about um, the uh, how COVID-19 is um, uh, impacting the environment and, and Matthew as well, if you have uh, comments. Yeah, I mean, one of the concerns we had was that governments would use uh, COVID-19 as an excuse to cut environmental regulations or cut enforcement of environmental regulations as well. Um, that's certainly something that has happened. I mean, the, the, the Trump administration has, has made a number of cuts and had a pretty sweeping ban on enforcement of uh, some, some important reporting and monitoring mechanisms. Um, you know, we've seen similar approaches in the Canadian province of Alberta, where the tar sands are located. Um, in Indonesia, Mexico, uh, different parts of the European Union. I mean, a lot of a lot of countries have, have taken this opportunity to uh, restrict environmental regulations. Lobbyists have been pretty active. The fossil fuel industry, the aviation industry, amongst them, uh, to try to to argue that these regulations are providing a lot of uh, financial burden at a time when they can't afford that. 
Um, so we expect that there will be more uh, cuts, and that's that's obviously a concern, especially given that some of these regulations are in place to protect human health, protect yeah. public health. Yeah. Um, what else? I mean, there's so many things. I mean, 2020 was shaping up to be a really important year in terms of climate uh, change. You know, the, the the climate negotiations are in Glasgow in in, in November. Those have been postponed. Um, 2020 is the year when countries are supposed to submit their NDCs, which is basically uh, the, the the commitments that states are putting forward in terms of cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and there was a growing momentum on the streets. You know, the Fridays for Futures movement, lots of youth protesters protesting the lack of of, uh, of action from governments to tackle the, the climate crisis. And so that that momentum has been stalled. So there's a lot of um, I guess uh, disappointment, perhaps, that some of that momentum has been lost. At the same time, there's there's some positives. Um, you know, air pollution has dropped in many locations around the world. You know, just because of the of the lockdown. Um, I say that's positive uh, in large part because air pollution is a massive problem. I mean, over four million people die prematurely every year from air pollution. It's it's this silent killer that just isn't talked about enough. Um, and of course, it attacks the respiratory and cardiovascular systems. You know, systems that are also uh, vulnerable from uh, from COVID, um, and then there's a, a huge opportunity here as well. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of money that's poured into economic stimulus packages to get economies restarted. Some of that money's already been 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 poured into the economies. Some of it is still under discussion, and it's really critical as fossil fuel companies, aviation companies, you know, other heavily emit emitting industries are, are are lobbying to be part of these of these economic bailouts that the, the, the economic stimulus packages are used to help transition away from fossil fuels and towards cleaner sources of energy. And that is the key to cutting greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. And so this, that, that transition was never going to happen without a huge uh, input of cash from governments. And, and, and so the stimulus packages from COVID hopefully will provide that opportunity. Whether or not that happens or not, uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um. Matthew, I was just remembering uh, when we showed the, the film, uh, at first, I remember asking you what was the the reaction talking about the the geopolitics and the elections coming up and everything. What what was uh, the reaction of Kiribati uh, to you showing your film at Sundance? I remember you telling me an interesting story. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's been it's been uh, almost four years that you know the government. Uh, former, I mean. The, Anate Tang has, has stepped down as a, as a president because he couldn't be re-elected. He would have been re-elected if he could, but like the constitution not, not allowing it. And for the last four years, a lot of things I, I kind of moved in um, in, in Kiribati. Um, so I, I mean, it's 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 a very unfortunate situation in a way because the new government that took over after President Tang was very, um, in a way, trying to. to Push, you know, most push down most of the policy that President Tang have, have been putting in place. So I, you know, my, my the film on the Tizak have been seen by the current government almost as a propaganda tool for the former president. So they've been really after the film, trying to shut down the film. Uh, I personally got arrested and deported from Kiribati when I I went just before Sundance. I went to Kiribati to show the film, and I was also with my my girlfriend. We were both in Kiribati because for me it was very important to share the story with with people of Kiribati. Even even before the premiere at Sundance, I think symbolically it was very powerful, you know, for like the premiere, the first time people would show the film was like in Kiribati. And after a few screenings, uh, we got arrested. And, and deported from the country because they saw it as, as a propaganda, basically, for the message of, of President Tong. And there's not, you know, the one one thing is is very clear here. This like it's been this political football uh, uh, in Kiribati. But it, what I find quite uh, amazing is is the same process that's happening, let's say, in the states, where you have. You know the Trump administration taking over and systematically, systematically trying to, you know, destroy the former the former uh, government policies from obviously from climate change, but some so many things. But it's it's just happening now in Brazil also. You know, where a new it's just like it's just becoming polit political football, and we don't have time, and and we, we cannot have you know those four years, five years, uh, um, you know, basically. Uh, 
uh, time between between government and wait and hoping for the next government to take back you know the ad, uh, climate change agenda and i think that's a very important message of the film that you know uh, climate change is not a political issue it should not be you know and we need global leadership and it's, it has to be addressed at, at, at another level but unfortunately it seems like it's still it's still the case so kiribas have been going through the same uh basically political pro uh, process where you know they've you know they've been um, I wouldn't say climate denier, but you know, quite close to climate deniers, where they just really embrace another, totally another view on, on, on climate change. But things are about to change. Um, elections are on the way. They, they already, you know, lost a lot of uh, MPs, and a new president will be elected very soon. So you know, the new government might, you know, change things again. But if we take the comparison again with the United States, who knows? What's going to be the you know the new uh, administration in November? But it's I'm just hoping that you know for the next four years, it, let's say here in the United States, we'll we'll stay, you know, on on a track to really uh, address those climate change issue and not just like being again in the political football for four years. Like this partisanship, basically dual partisanship is just very unfortunate. But what I, I find it very um, strange in a way is like like places as Kiribati you know, where they have everything to lose on climate change this, and they don't have much lobby, you know, it's not, it's just ideology, you know, they know, like I can understand in a country with very strong economy, there's so much lobby and so much economical power that can, you know, push policies, but in a place like Kiribati, why it's just ideological. And, and, and my hope is like we just really shift this paradigm and, and globally we just change the mindset and with this no, at the point where there's no more space for ideological debate around climate change. So I've been, you know, I've been also personally this kind of interesting uh, political journey being very close to uh, the head of states basically. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been, in the, at the end of the day, I've, you know, I'm, I've been campaigning with him in a way, with my film. Mm. Um, there was a question from the audience about, uh, uh, from Mike Roman with the upcoming president, presidential election and fall of parliament's majority. Uh, do you feel that there's any hope for climate action to resume in Kiribati? I, I think so. I mean, I, I don't I don't really know what's what's going to be in the next um, the next government. But something that I'm more worried about is not really you know the climate action is actually the move they did. Uh, it's another very important geopolitical move. Um, the new government. So on the president tongue, they had a very very strong connection with Taiwan, and and somehow between you know. Uh, Taiwanese have been have been very helpful, and they they've been you know trying to really uh, I think help in a good way you know most of I mean not only Kiribati many Pacific Island but this has been this very big shift a political shift where a lot of um, country and Kiribati of, uh, out of, on the front line have been building this relationship with Taiwan and the new government basically kicked Taiwan out and and bring back China in. And that's, you know, that's a very, because it's part of the Road and Belt Initiative. And they, so now they see Kiribati as this huge, I mean, Kiribati is actually the biggest Pacific nation. It's as wide as Australia in terms of ocean territory. So for the Chinese to be able to get Kiribati back in the program, it might, it might uh, like, they might actually push their own policy. They will, and, and they're already starting, you know, going after me, uh, independent media, uh, independent, you know, I, I mean, as I, I was victim of, but now, now it's like it's global, you know, like, and it's happening also in Vanuatu and other countries. But the fact that Chinese is taking over, like they, they really see Kiribati as a lot of resources, also from fisheries to to deep sea uh, to deep sea minerals, and to build like this uh, their offshore um, uh, pier, uh, big harbor, like big uh, deep water harbor. So I mean, it's you know I think it's uh, it might just change. The government might just bring back, you know, more, you know, poly action, climate action. But I'm, I'm more worried actually of what's, you know, the, now the, 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 the relationship with China will basically put pressure on, on resources. And I think we don't, Kiribati don't need, you know, power, powerful nation like China just, you know, taking all the resources and dictate what they, where they're going. Mm. You know. Um we we saw Note bringing his country's plight to, to various international bodies, to the UN, to asking around to countries to come and support his cause. 
I wanted to ask, uh, we have a Chicago committee member, John Lee, who wanted to ask, the human right to a healthy environment exists in international agreements. What is it going to take for governments to listen? Uh, Felix, I wonder. Yeah, I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of rights that were uh, touched upon in the film. Uh, I mean, the rights to adequate standard of living, the right to life, right to food, right to health, uh, right to water. I mean, there's a lot, uh, all that ties into the, you know, to right to a healthy environment. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of a lot of those those, you know, there are mechanisms in place for uh, affected communities to 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 complain. Uh, both at national levels and international levels, if, if states are not living up their obligations to to respect those 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 rights, or to you know states are not living up their obligations to progressively realize those rights, uh, at the end of the day, those those processes unfortunately are quite slow, they're cumbersome, they're often expensive, and not as effective as they as they should be. But at the end of the day, for states like Kiribati, I mean, it, it's all about political will, right? I mean, the the solutions are out there to tackle the climate crisis. Uh, there's there's very little time left. It's just going to take political will to do it at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And it's an it's a really interesting time uh, in all of our lives and in the world. I think um, we are used to coming together in the streets to advocate and push for governments uh, to pay attention. Um, and you know, as we're also busy dealing with this COVID crisis in our own personal lives, it's 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 an important thing to think about how we can still be coming together around this um, and advocating for these things that we really care about and that affect all of it. All of this is interconnected. Um, we have uh, another question from the audience. Um, so, uh, and forgive me if we've already touched upon this a bit, but uh, the comment was, I was amazed by Anote's leadership and vision. The film ended by telling us the opposition party is dismantling many of the policies how did the local population react? I, I don't know that we've touched on that. Uh, we know that the government is quite uh, swinging back to the other mm. side, but what are the local uh, folks think? So I think there's very important fact in, in Kiribati, like the government itself, you know, of course it's more like, an, I mean, it's like an administrative government, basically. Um, most of the power is extremely local. Um, you have something called like the Maniaba, which is like a, like a longhouse, a central, you know, it's a longhouse within the village. And every community have very central power, you know, they all have, the, you know, a spiritual uh, leadership. And it's, it's in a way, it's, it's, um, it's still, in terms of, of, of a political organization, it's still a very much tribal uh, political organization. So it's, you know, it's, it's very depends where you are. And of course, in the capital, it's different from the outer island. And of, of course, the level of education also change a lot on how you see things. Um, I think there's also uh, some difficulties for some, some people, especially in the outer island, to understand climate change because it's, it's coming very gradually. It's a very slow process. It's not like, you know, in Kiribati, it's just under the equator. So actually, the climate is most of the time pretty good. You know, they don't, they don't have like, very strong typhoons or you know hurricanes it's just um so it's 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 erosion through the you know the rising sea that takes the land you know slowly and slowly but you know from for most and because if it's under in the equator also you have this basically this mostly the same climate year long you know so from for most people especially uh, you know in the you know outer island also the, the capital they have this you know, a view of how, how nature works, of, of how, you know, they all this cosmology and cultural and spiritual uh, way of seeing things. So it's, it's hard also to get this, you know, the occidental data, the way science, uh, our, like, at least our science works. So they have to, like, kind of almost making a translation, try to, 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 to explain where things are going. So, and the other other point is like the church is very become became a very powerful uh, uh, i mean very part of, of the politics so most of the people they gather so they have the maniaba where like they all gather with the traditional shared traditional knowledge, knowledge culture dance written, like everything is shared in the maniaba but most of the maniaba are next to a church and and so the, the church have you know a lot of of um of influence and the kata and so Kiribati used to be mostly Catholic, and and what's happened, and actually that was during another time, time also, is a Pope uh, Francis uh, really recognized climate change, and uh, it has massive 
massive, massive impact because you know it's it's more than a billion people around the planet who all of a sudden start thinking about climate change as a man man made thing because the Pope recognizes it. So within Kiribati also we have the split between you know the people who listen to the Pope and 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 trust the Pope uh, as you know as a spiritual leader. But from the last, you know, maybe 10, 10 years, something, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, different churches coming and, and uh, the Mormon, actually, the Mormon church is getting stronger and stronger. And it's mostly the Mormon church from Utah, who is, you know, have a lot of finance and they were really strong in the Pacific and not only Kiribati, but basically all over. Uh, and it's, you know, and they, they basically climate deniers. And they're coming with a totally different rhetoric. And, and so the people who, you know, so we have within Kiribati also this kind of clash between the Mormon and the, and, and, and the Catholic. And, and I would say, the, you know, people who get foreign education, which have another kind of more Western uh, point of view. So then, you know, just like the political, where, where, where politics start playing, I, I guess, is like, you know, they start also a bit, a bit again, as it's happening in the United States, where you know, you, you, you embrace a narrative that will uh, um, attract you electorate, you know, basically. So having, having now um, a climate denying narrative will, will get the moment of voter behind your back. So it's, uh, yeah, it's where, where like all this, um, all this become a bit uh, complex and intertwined with a lot of different layers. Right. Yeah, I think um, so. There's a thread in the film, um, and that uh, people are. This is another comment from the audience. Clearly, people are being displaced for environmental reasons, but uh, it appears, uh, especially impacting uh, indigenous people the most. But environmental reasons aren't largely recognized as ground for refuge. Uh, what is Human Rights Watch seeing? Yeah. Uh yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I, I think there's there's increasing uh, uh, asylum claims that where the basis, or at least part of the basis, is is due to, to resource scarcity or, or, or climate change. Um, I mean, at the end of the refugee law, uh, basically came about in, in you know it was 1951. Like that's you know, refugee law did not envision this sort of, of situation, and I think there's a lot of advocacy that needs to be done and is being done to begin to recognize these uh these these different sorts of situations i mean this not to get into too much legal mumbo jumbo but there is something called complementary protection which essentially um uh provides uh refugee protection or was equivalent to refugee protection for those that would not typically be defined as refugees under the the refugee convention uh and that is something that that, that a lot of groups including rights watch are pushing uh for 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 some climate migrants to be recognized as um uh yeah so no, it's definitely something that's going to be that is an issue it's going to become more of an issue and and, and refugee law needs to, to catch up hmm. thanks so um there is another question uh about um the, the matthew you might know the answer to this one the film referred to phosphate mining in Kiribati, which first robs the country of resources uh what other work uh, is this kind of ties back to Felix? Uh, the question was, what other work on mining as climate justice is Human Rights Watch working on? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, I mean, mining, mining is something where we've done a lot of different uh, work looking at toxic pollution from mining, uh, polluted water, polluted soil, uh, displacement is a huge issue in, in, in many uh, mining sites around the world. I think one of the things that we're, we're quite cognizant of is if there is going to be a transition away from fossil fuels to cleaner sources of energy, so wind, uh, hydro, solar, that sort of thing, uh, there's a new suite of human rights abuses that could come with that transition. And, and one of those is that there will be a, an incredible increased demand for metals, so incredible increase in mining uh, to, to fuel the, the, the demand for, for these different types of, of energy sources. Um, and, and if you look at where cobalt or where you know, rare earth minerals, you know, some of the minerals that are used in the construction of turbines and batteries and the things that are necessary for this transition, they're in places where there is lots of potential for human rights abuses. I mean, Democratic Republic of Congo has 70% of the world's cobalt, for example. Um, so that's something that we're trying to, to be, to be cognizant about and, and ensure that, uh, yeah, that, that, as we 
as demand increases for minerals, that we're not just you know sort of substituting one set of human rights problems with fossil fuels uh, for another set with with increased mining. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge in the comment section on uh, Crowdcast, we're seeing uh, one of our commenters is from Kiribati, and uh, I wanted to just thank you for being here and sharing your comments. Um, uh, uh, one audience member said, Sermory had a very strong connection to nature, and she seemed to grieve it when she left home for New Zealand and when she walked along the beach. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about her relationship to nature, Matthew? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, I think that you know, most most of it, if not every everyone in Kiribati is deeply linked to. Uh, I mean, it's so deeply linked to the ocean. You know, like it's it's hard to explain. Uh, I mean, how how the ocean and nature is just everything in Kiribati. You know, because you just by by the fact that the geological feature of, of Kiribati is atolls. So basically they're living in this small strip of, uh, of land surrounding by the ocean. So it's not, it's not something you can escape from, you know, it's not like, there's no city to go to. It's not like, there's no, you cannot live outside of nature. There's no way around. It's like Kiribati is pure nature to start with, just because of the, you know, the geological aspect of the country. So of course, you know, for people like St. Mary who grew up in Kiribati and, and 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 just moved to a place like New Zealand, which you know it's 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 still like I mean New Zealand is so full of nature, but still Auckland is is, is a big city, it's an enormous city from a, a, a Kiribati perspective, and so it's it's you know it's I mean I think that scene is really powerful also, but it's like where where she can reconnect to that you know and and she so and I think it was a very it's a very good beautiful moment because she she goes to the ocean but the sand is black. You know, and it's just like it's something. It's it's the same ocean, it's the same water, it's the same power, but all of a sudden it's like it's a black sand, it's a volcanic black sand, and you have like, you know. So, I mean, I think it's a it's a, it's a way also to 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 show in the film that you know, yes, you know, you, you have the same, you can you can reconnect yourself to nature, but you know, you're losing something, and and something will be different forever. And I think that's a very important message of the film also because. You know, ultimately, people yes can migrate, can go, go somewhere, else, but if you lose connection with your homeland, you lose something forever. And and it's a spiritual that spiritual connection we have to learn. And and you know we don't have to be spiritual, but the spiritual connection is there. You know we all know. You know, like I mean, I'm I'm going through personally now. You know, with this COVID nineteen crisis, where I'm I'm you know I'm I'm far from my homeland, and I'm like where where's my you know where's my my roots you know and just like I think it's it's something totally human. We all will feel you know sometimes homesick, sometimes like where's the home, where's the land you know, and the the point is. I think it's a very big difference with climate refugees because in, 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 in the case of Kiribati, let's say, you know, Samari might never be able to go back home ever. And what's she going to tell to the child, you know, the newborn in New Zealand, you know, like once we had a land, you know, but the land is, is forever gone. And that's, you know, that makes a very big difference with all political refugees, you know, because you have, you can have a Syrian family in the States and the grandmother can tell the child, you know, we, you have a land somewhere, you know, the other side. And, and dream about that land. And I think that's, in terms of the narrative, it's a very big difference because what you can tell the next generation when you know your land is not, not anymore. So I think it's, you know, it's something that's really new in terms of you know, um, human displacement. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's just so uh, poignant in the film and heartbreaking seeing how they think about how can we continue our community abroad, how, you know, when we lose our traditions on this land, can we carry them over uh, in our new place? Um, it's, it's very difficult. Um, I wonder uh, if you guys can both talk about uh, what are you working on now? Um, what are your projects that you're focusing on? Yes, yeah, so um I'm, I'm, I'm working on another story somehow which really linked to the Pacific, but it's also a global story. Um, it's, it's really linked 
put to the energy yeah, crisis and just uh, like just to touch a, a little bit about this uh, just before but so as we're moving away from uh, from fossil fuel we're building this new green so-called green revolution but that's gonna put a lot it's gonna it's already putting a lot of pressure on, on some specific metals needed for, to build the batteries uh, which is cobalt nickel and manganese mostly um and so it has a huge deposit of uh, those metals down in the deep sea uh, under the form of polymetallic nodules. So the whole industry now is pushing uh, to basically collect those uh, polymetallic nodules. And why it's kind of connecting to my work in Kiribati is um, all, you know, most of the Pacific nation, Kiribati, Tonga, uh, Nauru, Nui, um, Cook Island, they all have, you know, big stakes in this upcoming uh, industry because there is a sitting on, on those nodules. So it might actually be quite interesting to see what will happen in the next decades because, you know, they, they might, you know, the, the Pacific might become the new source of, of rare, uh, of, of important metals, you know, and it's, it's basically the new oil and gas, the new fossil fuel. So it's going to sh shift a lot of, you know, I mean, we're going to might be bring actually a lot of wealth uh, also to some of some of those countries, but also shifting a lot of the of the geopolitics. So it's more like an energy uh, uh, film. Um, I'm not really there's not much about you know let's say straightforward human rights issues because it's it's mine on deep sea and not really you know it's not like the story in Congo or different LDC or different places where you know it's really direct issue with child labor and everything but uh, in a way also it's just um you know it just bring back to also the colonial time with nauru and, and different places and to be sure that you know as we move ahead uh, with mining to be sure that we're not re making it like re repeat the history again you know and, and and do the same mistake we did in the past so it's you know that's kind of this human uh, aspect of it um, I think um, something that would be uh, really good to hear from both of you, I think, is, uh, you know, after watching the film and being impacted by it, um, here we are in our homes, but what are, what are things that, what are some things that we can all do at this time to try to have an impact on this issue and to support uh, what you're both doing? So, should I say, so, um, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very, I think, I think the start with really recognizing that, you know, climate, like the narrative of climate change have to be linked to climate justice. And, and, and in the case of Kiribati, I'm, I'm sorry to say, and it's very hard to say, but there's not much that can be done in, in a way to basically save Kiribati uh, uh, from, from, from a crossing for future, because there's enough, you know, gas into the atmosphere to ensure that, you know, the, the, the sea will continue to rise. So it's not a situation where like we can we can basically save you know Kiribati easy. It's like we have easy fix now we don't and we have to be realistic. But then the next question is like how how to recognize you know that uh, globally the, you know we we create this problem and and now that we have to be accountable and realizing the, the, the climate you know, human rights and climate justice aspect of it. And I, I'm sure you don't have to go all the way to Fiji or, or New Zealand and even in in our neighborhood, we will see more and more people, migrants, that have, have been displaced because of climate change and to be more, you know, gentle and to accept them more because, you know, it's, I think it's uh, very, um, uh, very linked and, and even, I, mean, I guess, for, for a US audience, you know, like we're talking about this, you know, I mean, it's not not in the news anymore. But for some for some in the world, there was all this issue about this uh, uh, migrant caravan and just like trying. I mean, you know, building the wall and all this. And and to realize, you know, and I hope like also and, and it is our could you know open the eye that you know those migrants are actually also moving their own land because of climate change. And you know, like those people who cannot. There's a lot of farmers in the highland in, in Honduras and Guatemala and those places that cannot, you know, grow food anymore. They cannot grow corn anymore because it's because it's all affected by climate change. So ultimately, they will have to find a new land and a new place. So I think it's it's a global story, and I hope you just like uh, increasing empathy through Anote's arc and 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 just you know bringing back to you know where you are and and see around you and be more gentle and more more open. 
for 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 you know for basically this big migration crisis that is on the way and will just increase drastically in the next decades. Mm. Yeah, Felix. Um, you know, I, we're uh, we're getting a couple of extra questions here uh, as we wind things down. But uh, you know, as uh, as Matthew said. Um, for Kirbas, I mean, when they were looking at uh, designing underwater cities as an option uh, for countries that are losing their land, um, and then Anote saying that at the uh, at the end of the film that this is an act of war, he sees this as an act of war on his country. That if if you don't do something about climate change, then this is an act of war, and you're wiping us out essentially. Um, what do you think? Uh, we can do to push for accountability now as global citizens what are some some tangible things that everyone can do uh, after seeing the film yeah i mean it's, it's it's a big question i mean climate change is the issue uh and you know i think too often you know as, as matthew alluded to it becomes like a political football it becomes a political game it becomes ideological uh and that that obviously needs to change i mean this 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 is not about ideology i mean this is about survival for many of the world's most vulnerable populations um you know i think you know m many of the, the the people participating in this are are in the united states you know there's a presidential election coming up and i think one of the the the, the challenges that the world has faced in in moving forward and tackling the climate crisis has been the big emitters united states china have not been living up to their uh to their obligations um so, so hopefully that that will begin to change. I mean, there is a there is a feeling that if the United States would show some climate leadership, that perhaps some of the other big polluters would would follow. I'm not saying that's the case. I have no idea, but that is that is what a lot of people say. Um, so I, I think it's a pretty critical time for for everyone to 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 be ensuring that this is the issue that is being talked about in the in the presidential election. That you know that you know that that you know considerable amounts of the population, or considerable amounts of of those that 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 deny the existence of climate change. Are, are in places like the United States, and that, and that you know, if someone makes a comment about climate change not you know being a fraud or being a scam, that they are challenged on that. I mean, this is you know we need to get we need to get past this and move forward, uh, because there really isn't much time. And yes, it's too late for Kiribati, it's too late for some other low-lying island states, um, but it's only going to get much much worse uh, unless we take urgent urgent action. Mm. Thank you both so much. Um, we really uh, look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. Um, if folks uh, have just tuned in or have just heard the, the last few minutes of this, uh, Anote's Art uh, is what we've been discussing, a, doc a beautiful documentary by Matthew Reese. And uh, we uh, encourage everyone, if you haven't seen it yet, if you're not in the United States and you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube right now, um, check out uh, Anote's Art. It's on iTunes. Um, and you know, and also please uh, learn more about the work uh, that Felix and our researchers and our act activists are doing with Human Rights Watch to defend human rights activists around the world and monitor the global situation. Um, also, uh, encourage everyone to uh, stay in touch. Uh, we'll, we will post uh, the social handles for both of you. So Matthew, we can hear about uh, the next projects that you work on. Uh, of course, we at the Film Festival will be very eager to see uh, your film once it's ready. Um, and in the meantime, thank you all, uh, everyone tuning in here. Thank you for uh, all the, the folks in Human Rights Watch uh, Chicago Committee for really believing that uh, in this film and getting us all here together tonight to talk about this important issue. Um, we, If you are interested, uh, be sure to, uh, to check out our poll below. Uh, we want to know, we do have another film club event coming up, a free film for you all. Uh, next week, we'll be showing the film Slay the Dragon. Uh, we are now 178 days from the, or actually 179, we need every day, uh, from the US uh, election. And this film, Slay the Dragon, that we'll be showing uh, with uh, the LA Film Club is about voting rights and equality and the importance of every, every vote counting. So we really encourage you all to sign up for that. And uh, thank you so much, Matthew, for tuning in from Bali. Uh, thank you so much, Felix, from Ottawa. Um, Felix and I both breathing, uh, missing bedtime routines with our kids. <laughs> Luckily, no one ran in in the middle of this. So exactly, yeah. <laughs> we're all good. Um, thank you again, Matthew. And thank you, thank everyone. You so thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.